Hi, I'm Maris Kreisman, and I'm so thrilled to welcome you tonight to another excellent virtual event at McNally Jackson. If you go to McNallyJackson.com and look at our events calendar, you'll see all the amazing writers and programs we're hosting in the coming weeks. So please keep an eye on the site or subscribe to our newsletter to hear more about what's coming soon. There will be time at the end of tonight's conversation for your questions, so start thinking about them now. And you can put your questions in the Zoom chat and we'll get to them towards the end of the evening. We're so glad that even though we can't all be in the same room at the moment, we're still able to host events during this difficult time. As we've weathered the pandemic and reopened all four of our locations for browsing and shopping, indie bookstores like ours still need more support. And so if you enjoy free events like this one and want us to keep posting more of them, please buy books from us. <laughs> Throughout the evening, I'll post links in the chat to buy Kirk's and Diane's books from McNally Jackson, and we highly encourage it. Um, it it's a great honor to introduce uh, tonight's uh, wonderful authors. S. Kirk Walsh is a writer in Austin, Texas. Her work has been widely published in the New York Times Book Review, Long Reads, Story Quarterly, and Electric Literature, among other publications. Over the years, she's been a resident at UCROSS, Yaddo, Ragdale, and Virginia Center for the Creative Arts. She's the founder of Austin Bat Cave, a writing and tutoring center that provides free writing workshops for young writers throughout Austin. And The Elephant of Belfast is her first novel. And joining her tonight is Diane Cook, the author of the novel, The New Wilderness, which was long listed for the 2020 Booker Prize and the story collection, Man vs. Nature, which was a finalist for the Guardian First Book Award, the Believer Book Award, the Penn Hemingway Award, and the LA Times Award for First Fiction. Her writing has appeared in Harper's, Tin House, Granta, and other publications. And her stories have been included in the anthology's Best American Short Stories and the O. Henry Prize Stories. She's a former producer for the radio program, This American Life, and was the recipient of a 2016 fellowship from the National Endowment for the Arts. She lives in Brooklyn with her husband, daughter, and son. And um, I'm so delighted to turn it over to you, Kirk, for a reading. Thank you, Maris. And thank you to the bookstore for hosting us. Um, McNally Jackson is one of my favorite bookstores in the city. And it's just an honor to be with everyone tonight. So. Thank you for coming and thank you, Diane, for ha having a conversation with me. So um, in light of today is April 15th and April 15th, 1941 was the night of the Easter Tuesday bombings. And that event is the centerpiece of my novel, The Elephant of Belfast. Uh, the story begins actually in October, 1940 when a young female zookeeper named Hetty Quinn uh, meets her, an elephant named Violet, and eventually she becomes her full-time zookeeper or caretaker basically at the Bellevue Zoo, which is, um, yeah, further north in Belfast. And so I'm just gonna read a couple paragraphs. And as I said, this is, uh, the night the bombs have already started to fall and she has run to the zoo to make sure that Violet, yeah, to just check on her given the trauma that's going on. Hetty ran towards the zoo rear entrance as the sky lit up again. She unlocked the padlock and flung the gate open. At the elephant house, Hetty found Violet pacing the yard. As Hetty slowed to approach the elephant, her ribs aching from the run, the acrid smell of fresh dung hit her like a slap in the face. Violet released a deep guttural cry. I'm here by Hetty said softly, I'm here. Light gathered and scattered in the sky. Hetty heard the continuing drone of aircraft. Dozens of bombers were up there now and they all seemed to be approaching from the Northeast along the shores of the Belfast Lock and flying directly over the Whitewell Road. Hetty rubbed Violet absently behind one of her ears. The elephant skin felt cold and clammy. She rested her cheek against Violet's heaving side 
and rubbed the elephant behind her ear again, speaking softly to her. The way that Thomas used to whisper to Hetty when she couldn't fall asleep when a thunderstorm rolled over their neighborhood. Only then did she notice the wall of animal cries and howls that surrounded the elephant house. It was different than the other night, louder, fiercer, and it came from all sides. Like everything was escalating to another level, another volume, another rung of fear, another circle of violence. As Hetty listened, the fine hairs on the nape of her neck stood on end. The animal's calls gained more definition. The growls of the lions and leopards, the roars of the black bears, the cackles of the hyenas, the shrieks of the monkeys and baboons, the brays of the sea lions, the squawks of the toucans and macaws. It was as if a call and response were taking place between the animals and the shadows and darkness transformed into its own sort of mythic cathedral with all its devout congregants praying in their own distinctive tongues at the sacred altar of their greater animal God with hopes of reaching a higher state, a higher consciousness, so they could endure the suffering of higher proportions. They were singing, singing to something. Thank you. <laughs> <clears throat> that was beautiful. And your book is beautiful. And it's brutal and gorgeously written. And the descriptions are unbelievably precise, but not, um, but they don't lose anything in their precision. Um, I think uh, since, since it's the bombing uh, anniversary, maybe we can jump right into uh, talking about like how you write the physicality of the destruction or that around that the that Hetty and everyone in the book sees and experiences. Um, because I found it like it's so visceral and it seems so real that it was pretty stunning to me. Um, but it's not this like overly dramatic war story or even moment when the bombs are coming. It's very like descriptive and it just feels real and not like overdone and I wondered like how did you get to that point was it a process to to get that tone right or how did how did you gather all of the material and then how did you make it fictional lyrical but also like true at the same time that's a good question <laughs> you have 30 seconds to answer <laughs> okay so I'll just say, um, I mean, as you were asking that question, one of the last notes I got, uh, Elizabeth McCracken was one of the last people, um, writers to read the Lovely. manuscript. And her kind of main note to me for the next revision I did was, you need to commit the language to Hetty's soul. Mm -hmm. And that note did help me kind of I think press more feeling in life, regardless of what was taking place in the scenes. I mean, as you know, the bombings and then some scenes at the zoo are pretty intense. And I think with this book, I did do a lot of research and with the bombings, I interviewed survivors of the Blitz and their experiences, particularly the woman that I quote in my epigraph, um, Ethan O'Connor, she was seven years old and was in a shelter and was in fact buried alive. And I talked to her a couple times and I really used a lot of the details of what she experienced. And, you know, because of her generosity and, you know, here I am a writer from the States coming to Belfast to write about this monumental event that actually not a lot of people know about. A lot of people know about the London Blitzes and uh, 
I wanted to do justice to the story. And I think what kind of, one of the things that kept me going were the people who gave me their stories and allowed me to turn them into fiction. I mean, one of the other people I interviewed was, so the story is inspired by Denise Austin, who's uh, passed away. And so when my husband, Michael, and I went to Belfast, one of the first people I interviewed was David Rams Ramsey, her last living relative, and he's a solicitor. Mm -hmm. And I said, um, I'm gonna make stuff up, is that okay? <laughs> and he said, yes. So I got my permission from the family um, to take Good. some fictional liberties with the story. That's what you wanna hear. Um, the details, like the, can you talk a little bit about how you wrote like about the physical violence um, and how I know you, we, when we were talking before we got on here, you said that you worked on this for seven years and the descriptions in the book are hard, both when I mean, this whole conversation will probably have some spoilers and I apologize for that to anyone who hasn't read the book, but it's worth reading anyway, it's not a thriller. It's, <laughs> you know, it's just worth reading. Um, so, when the blitz happens and then they have to uh, kill the animals, the just the details are so real and thoughtful. And I think it, but not overdone, like I said before, like, or overblown. And that like, how did that, how did, how did you figure out that language? Was it language that you read in, in accounts or did you kind of land on it uh, after, you know, working with the material for a while or any, you know, any other, <laughs> any other option is fine. So kind of my original starting point, I, so I had heard about Denise Austin on the radio and started to do research and I realized not that much had been written about her. And I contacted the Belfast Zoo. And one thing they sent me was like a five page essay describing what happened at the zoo. And it did list the animals. And so I knew the scope of it. And I knew what happened with the head zookeeper. So I did kind of adhere pretty closely to what happened and then when my husband and I went to Belfast, we spent two days at the Belfast Zoo. And there's this wonderful zookeeper there named Raymond Robinson who can tell a good yarn. And, but he was, he showed us the old zoo which actually exists below the new zoo. And so we actually got to at, stand in the elephant house that much of my, where Violet lives. And I think being able to be at the zoo and talk to him. I think for me, I mean, I could have written what happened to the animals. I mean, I was thinking about, I mean, I, we read a lot, all fiction writers and you don't quite know what is influencing, but I will say that Lolita by Nabokov, the violence happens in the margins of that book. And it leaves it up to the reader to decide on Humbert Humbert's guilt, depending on the reader. And I didn't, I just wanted to tell the story. I didn't want to leave the violence in the margins. I wanted to also allow for the suffering of the animals to be analogous to what the deaths that happened about a thousand civilians died the night of Easter Tuesday, which is one of the things that drew me to it a little bit because I was drawing from my experiences of being in New York during the attacks of September 11th. So I think it was a lot of revision. I mean, I do remember in later drafts constantly working on that scene, like going over and over and over again. And one person that kind of inspired me about writing violence was uh, Karham Mahajan in his book, The Small, The Association of Small Bombs. And he talked about kind of trying to use 
softer language to describe violence and to also allow the characters to feel more than one thing at once. And so I think those were things I kind of was trying to keep in mind, but also to tell the truth as much as I could. Oh, you're muted. Uh, Diane. Yeah, oh. I know I was, <laughs> then I tried to unmute myself and I, I have a baby who's screaming. So I was trying okay. to avoid uh, that uh, like over overlay. Um, uh, well, I think the descriptions are so, they're perfect then there's, they, I like that language that soften the language of the violence because in it, it, it lets the reader experiencing, experience it with like a myriad of emotions and not just the like repulsion and terror like that you would have if you were like being like hit over the head with like, you know, like all sorts of like the big blow, you know, like the big violent words, which is, I imagine like what it must have been like to be there where, I mean, you're not, there are so many emotions running through someone who's in that situation. I imagine that it isn't just like people running for their lives, like on a monster movie where it's just like, it's either this or that. Um, and you do it so well. And the animals, I was really astonished by those scenes where they, I mean, all of the animal writing I thought was amazing. And I mean, I do love animals and reading about animals and I thought you did such an amazing job. But I was really struck by when they end up being, uh, shot after the blitz and it was so interesting because I definitely felt more affected by that and I th I started to think about why I mean I'm not a misanthrope like I love people too and I also love animals um, but I think it was such a nice weight or counterweight to um, like taking in war and like, especially like a war we've heard about and we know, and we know kind of the things that happened. And yes, the specific moments are like, will affect us, but then to follow it up with something like that feels so utterly senseless mm -hmm. as the animal killings makes you stop and say, why, am I, why is this the senseless thing to me? What happened? like the previous like 40 pages is actually the senseless thing, but I've become a human who sees it differently now or is so like, I don't know, uh, immune to the power of it, even when the language and the writing is so powerful. Like it doesn't, your writing about it like totally stunned me, but I had to recognize that it took a lot to stun me. You know what I mean? Um, about those moments. And I just found, I know it really happened in real life that way, but <laughs> but there's, I mean, maybe it's that it's like a lucky, a lucky break for you, but I found it like the perfect counterweight and kind of this, I don't know, it made everything come home for me personally. Um, I can't imagine what it was like to write those moments though. Of all of, it, of all yeah, of it, of all of it. Yeah, I mean, one thing, um, kind of the moment where Hetty, like, I would say there definitely is a threshold where the character crosses over into a different kind of way of being in the world and her agency changes and her purpose changes and it's after that scene. And so I think mm -hmm. a part of it as I was revising it, because a big part of writing this book was really trying to figure out Hetty. And mm -hmm. I think um, those scenes provided the velocity for her to kind of move into the last third of the book and really begin to make choices she couldn't have made otherwise. And so I think as a novelist, I had some understanding like, 
things are really going to be different after this. But I, I also, um, like I said, I did a lot of drafts and it kept changing the pacing and everything. So, you know, I think we can have intentions like it's going to be this kind of novel. Mm -hmm. And then at the end, it's a somewhat different kind of novel. So we were talking a little earlier about what kind of novel is it? And it's, it <laughs> seems like it's historical fiction. And is that, how did you land in that realm? Is that something that you read a lot or liked? I did not read a lot of historical fiction. Um, I, my teacher was Yale Doctorow, I would say my most influential teacher and I had read his books and the book of Daniel is probably my favorite and World's Fair. And having him as a teacher, I mean, he did talk a lot about like, entering a world and using your imagination and knowing that the history can provide scaffolding. But after I left NYU, I was not a huge reader of historical fiction. And I think this, you know, there's a famous quote, well, a quote I return to a lot in my teaching from Tobias Wolf, where he says, we don't choose our material, our material chooses us. And I feel like that was the case with the story. And I did read, I, 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 right around when I was writing it, I read some slim historical novels. So like Snow Hunters by Paul Yoon mm -hmm. or um, Margot Livesey's Eva Moves the Furniture or Dennis Johnson's Train Dreams. And these aren't mm -hmm. your conventional right. epic doorstep historical novels. And I think reading these kind of more, or even housekeeping by Marilyn Robinson, there's an element of in between and not really being historical fiction or contemporary fiction. And I feel that way about all those books. I mean, they certainly could be put in the historical fiction camp. And I think that's where I was coming from that I was looking to write into a gap because the Belfast Blitz hadn't been written about that much. I knew I had the experience of having been in the city during the attacks and I could draw from that emotional experience. Um, but yeah, it was just like any other, I mean, this is my third novel, but it is my first historical novel and it was hard. I mean, I won't lie, but I do feel like when I was in the actual writing, I was just trying to write the best sentence I could. And, you know, one of my other teachers at NYU was the Australian writer, Peter Carey, and he defined storytelling as a heightened sense of being alive. And I think that's what I was working towards. And also honoring you know, the people who died in Belfast, the people who died in New York City. I, I did have a very good friend. His name was John McNeil and he fought many campaigns in World War II. And we used to meet on the Upper West Side at this diner called fittingly John, Old John's. And <laughs> he's the only World War II veteran I knew. And he would tell me stories of, um, fighting and the trauma. And I think a part of it, you know, he is in there too. Um, and Mr. Wright's, uh, his fighting in World War I, I drew from some of what my friend Chan experienced. Mm -hmm. what, was, um, what was the most satisfying part um, to write in this book? The or nuns. to like figure out yeah, yeah the nuns um, <laughs> I think the nuns so the elephant later in the book ends up at uh, the refuge is at a catholic convent and the nuns came much later in the writing process but they were like a gift and I just felt like I don't know where they came from I was trying to figure out places the elephant needed to be hid and I was like, what about a content? And, you know, there's a later scene where Violet is on the beach with the nuns. And that was probably my, you know, and I, I think I was mindful that 
it was a novel of loss and I needed to find moments of levity and joy. And the nuns, I don't know, they're just like these strong, take no bullshit women. And I really liked them a lot. I also really, and a later character that arrived in the later dress was also Eliza Crowley, who um, works in the canteen at the zoo. And she kind of reflects back to Hetty how good she has it. And um, she was also a gift. So those were the characters that kind of came later um, that I felt really grateful um, that somewhere in my creative brain they arrived. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, They're um, amazing characters. The nuns are wonderful. And, and there's even like kind of suspense attached to their showing up and with attached to Liam and what's happening, like what's happening behind those walls. Um, yeah, I loved them. Um, how, so I think one of the ways that we got connected to talk about this book is um, our interest in mothers and daughters um, and writing about that, those relationships. Um, and I wondered about Rose and Hetty mm -hmm. and where, you know, I, like where did their relationship go wrong for, you know, at least for part of the book before Hetty comes to some realizations. And then I, I started to think of like, was their relationship or the problems of their relationship like inevitable? And I guess I'm, I wonder that in both life, like that's just mothers and daughters, but also for the book, like that relationship seems to have primed Hetty to to be something for Violet and for Violet to be something for her. And it's almost like that couldn't have happened if she'd had a normal relate or like, you know, like an average relationship with her mother. So like, how did that all come about? Was that always gonna be the case? Well, I tried to write an average relationship and it didn't work out. <laughs> No, I think that means it's not possible. <laughs> yeah, I tried. I was like, yeah, I don't know. I, I wrote a lot of different iter versions of the mom. And I think, well, my mom had a nervous breakdown in the fall of 2012. And that's about the same time I started this book. And she never, she came out of this acute depression, maybe for seven months out of a seven year span of time. And it was a very difficult experience, but it also sort of um, brought to light how difficult it was growing up. And uh, yeah, we went through phases. Uh, I'm the youngest of four and, um, you know, she had stretches where she couldn't get out of bed and um, we didn't really have anyone to take care of us. And um, I did turn to the animals you know, we had cats and dogs and they gave me something. And I think, you know, that's sort of the origin story in a way, but I think as I was writing the book, as I went through the experience of my mom I and mean, she passed away in February of 2020, but I felt like I was able to see her for who she was and see her kind of the fuller, kind of more dimensional person who had suffered so much in her life. And I don't know if Hetty, you know, Hetty is only 20 and doesn't quite have that um, kind of wisdom yet, but I think she does begin to accept her mom in terms of her inabilities and limitations, particularly, um, you know, she won't see so Hetty's sister Anna dies in childbirth before the novel starts and uh, has Liam with her husband and he was Catholic and so the Rose refuses to see her granddaughter because of the interfaith marriage and I you know I yeah I guess it's complicated <laughs> but I do know when I read your book The New Wilderness and the relation I cried when I read your book um, and because the mother 
you know, when does the daughter lose the mother and when does the mother lose the daughter? And I think that kind of where things begin and end is a lifetime process. And, mm -hmm. you know, I think for me, like the fact that I lost my mom and then had to do copy edits. <laughs> Look, I was like, well, that's interesting. Um, <laughs> what am I going to change now? And I did change, you know, I just kind of kept tinkering, but I did feel a lot of love. Um, and I hope at the end of this book that that's what readers, you know, feel love and hope. And even, you know, families or my experience with my own family that my mom was a pretty broken person. There's not much we could do about it. And, but we still manage to, you know, survive and thrive in a way. And I think with Hetty at the end of the book, you know, that she's gonna survive, so. Yeah, definitely. She, yeah, you can see that and you can see the love. I mean, you can see even in their quiet moments together, like in the earlier in the book, or even they're like more, you know, where Hetty might feel like nagged or bothered. Like you can see them both quietly striving for something that they can't access. Like they, it, you just see it and it's heartbreaking and the heartbreak comes from um it comes from you can see them that, that they want it and that there's love that's where the heartbreak comes from not because Hetty doesn't have a mother who loves her you know what I mean mm -hmm. and I definitely felt her shift um and her like the where she that all that striving to understand something for Hetty like re leads somewhere by the end for sure mm -hmm. she's like such a wonderful character because she is young and she does have, she's the, she's the hero, but she also does things or has reactions that are very honest, but they're like, oh, heady, you know, like, don't, don't think that, or you're being so mean, you know, like, she's like a real multi, you know, she's a real person with all of the good parts and the bad parts, and they're all on the page, and it makes you, it, again, it just makes it feel so, you're so immersed because you get to see it all. And I really loved that. Um, I think, you know, because there's, I think you like World War II books and, you know, like there's like definitely a, you know, like a lineage of like kind of rose colored glasses over this time or about the characters and they're all going to be like, the cream of the crop, stiff upper lip, like everything, like they do it all and they do it right and everyone's brave and that's not true. And I just, she was like a wonderful character to follow because she's flawed and she's young and you can groan at something that she does or you can go, oh no, oh Hetty, don't. And, and then she can win your heart again. It's just, I loved it. Um, I also say, I'll say this and then maybe we can look at, um, see if there's some questions that came in and I have other ones too. Um, you mentioned like needing points of levity in the book. And I will say that for me, every moment where there was an animal like on the page and it's not just cause I like animals but because like there was every moment of an animal especially Violet was uh, like a moment of joy in the book. And I think Violet, even in moments when she's scared, she just embodies this like incredible energy and you capture it all in the language. And she was, she was my um, like laugh relief, a comic relief. <laughs> she was my comic relief, just even watching her move or make a squeak or just do whatever. I mean, I thought it was like, it was a really nice way to have things soften, you know, a, a hard book. Um, let's look, let's take a look at the chat and see. <laughs> Is it true you met Bruce Springsteen when you were in Belfast? 
is a question from Michael Dolan. <laughs> yeah, that's my husband. Um, Hi. <laughs> he wants me to, so when we went to Belfast, I'll tell this story. Um, <laughs> I uh, wanted to stay in a bed and breakfast, like a red brick row house, um, similar to Hetty and Rose's house. And so I found a place on the Lisbon Road and so before we got there, I talked to the owner and he's like, are you going to the Bruce Springsteen concert? And I was like, no, I'm <laughs> coming to do research for my novel. And, um, and he's like, well, everyone else who's staying in this bed and breakfast is going to these Bruce concerts down the street. And it, uh, there's a concert hall called the King's Hall. And we get there and, you know, we're kind of, yeah, everyone's like, you're not going to see Bruce. So it turns out everyone else staying in the bed and breakfast is like a concert goer of um, great, I mean, just like the most pa passionate concert goers. They've seen <sighs> hundreds and hundreds of shows. And there's a woman in a wheelchair and often she'd be outside the bed and breakfast smoking pommels and telling us that Bruce had saved her life and because uh, she's gone to all these concerts. So we walked down the road when I think it was the first night and we didn't have tickets. And we were maybe going to try to get tickets, but we were like, yeah, we're here to do the research for the book. You know, this is what our purpose is. And so we sat, there was just like an open field and the sun was setting and there was like a salmon light kind of, it was just a beautiful night. And Bruce Springsteen comes out on stage. You can find this clip on YouTube. And we could hear him, it was crystal clear. And he started singing, this little light of mine. And it was this moment where I was like, I felt like the Belfast trip was saying, here you go. And I did put that song in the book um, mm -hmm. as my nod to, you know, Bruce saying, you know, I felt like, and we listened to some of the concert, he played selections from Nebraska. It was really beautiful. But um, so that's the Bruce Springsteen story. I didn't mean him, but I think the people, like particularly the woman in the wheelchair, you know, she's able to get that close access. And I think she did not meet him, but talk to some of the band members, so. That's good. <laughs> That's amazing. Um, I'm glad you could go. Yeah, the other um, thing they did, I'll just tell this other story. So Game yeah, of Thrones please. was also being filmed um, in Belgium. What was? Uh, Game of Thrones. Oh, yeah. Sorry. And yes, I've heard of it. Yeah, you heard of it. They were shooting, <laughs> um, this is in 2013, and uh, Michael's sister uh, connected us with one of the producers, and we got to go on a tour of the studios, which is actually at the shipyards. Oh, wow. And so it actually really helped me to be able to walk among those buildings. And the main studio is um, called the Paint Hall. And it's actually where the Titanic was painted. And so it did really help. Even though I wasn't a watcher of the Game of Thrones at that time, um, Michael did get to sit in the Iron Throne. And oh, we took a picture. <laughs> Very good, Michael. <laughs> um, what one thing I really noticed and loved in the book that I suspect is just because it's set in Ireland somewhere, but or Northern Ireland, um, but it's this like repetition of the road names in this way that almost feels lyrical, like 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 the whole book is like one long ballad where you're constantly being reminded of where you are and that, that of these pathways that bring people together and take them apart. Um, was that something that just, was that conscious? Was it just how you knew it had to sound? Like the Antrim road and the, and the white something road. It's just, yeah. so they, they were like beats. So the, they use an article before every road name and in Raymond Robinson the zookeeper uh, did read an early draft and he's like you need to put a the in front of every road um, <laughs> and after I did that 
I started to do it, it became more of an internal beat for me. So like mm -hmm. the floral hall and the original name actually of the book was the Antrim Road, but then mm -hmm. someone told me I had to change it. Um, <laughs> uh, but it was the, I did always, particularly at the beginning, I had a map of Belfast nearby. And then one of the things I did in New York City um, at the main branch was a map room then they had old maps of Belfast from 1930. And so I did try to be pretty deliberate. I, there's a historian, his name's Brian Barton, and he's a foremost scholar of the Blitz. And he did read the book for me and make sure that it was accurate. And I think some of his corrections might have impacted some of the kind of movement through the city, but yeah, so I got a lot of help. It feels, I mean, it's like it's the accuracy is one thing, but it also it this, it creates this other world kind of like it's almost like you are living in the map, like as you're reading mm. it. And I really liked it. It, it was like wonderfully it had this wonderful rhythm to it. Um, I I have one. If anyone has a question, they want. Oh, okay, here we go. Um, <laughs> In the writing of the book, did you feel you had to transcend the differences in American and Northern Ireland, European culture and language? If yes, how would you characterize those differences? And that's from Scott. Hi, Scott. Yes, I mean, it was something I was thinking about. Uh, it is a close third person, so that gives, gave me a little room to sort of work on the narrative voice, but I was thinking about kind of the differences of the way people speak in Ireland and Northern Ireland and in the country and in the city. I mean, it certainly was one of the challenges of the book. And I think for me, kind of, Diane, what you were talking about, like the rhythms and, you know, the passage I read, I, I think I was trying to find my own kind of language for it because you know it was ambitious to write mm. about a place that isn't my own and I think whenever I heard from a reader in Northern Ireland or Ireland and then Margot Lissy read it for me who's nice. Scottish and you know they would correct me um, but for the most part they were pretty they were supportive and I, I felt like I had to trust the language, but know that I had to learn, you know, kind of the nuances, particularly between the Catholic and Protestants. And, you know, there's just a lot of kind of richness in the city and, but also the historical piece too. So mm -hmm. I was thinking about it a lot and doing my best to um, capture it, but Brian Barton, I mean, he did really help me kind of with the sectarian tensions to, cause that kind of comes out mostly in dialogue. Um, mm -hmm. And so, yeah, it was, yeah, a lot of revisions. Um, he did one thing he sent me, you know, I would get emails from him it, early in the morning, you know, there's six hours ahead and that with the nuns, he sent me some diary entries written by nuns during the Blitz. Oh, wow. And it was just like amazing. I mean, I, he would like, I'd get these emails of language <laughs> and I would, you know, have to pick and choose. And, you know, you can't shoe, shoehorn in language. It has to be organic. But I felt like over the digital transom, I would get these little nuggets that would help me. <laughs> That's amazing. Um, did you read a lot of things like firsthand, like in their own words, kind of uh, documentation of, of the things that happened or even of the city at that time? You must have, right? Yeah, well, I did the interviews. Um, mm -hmm. And then I also, there were a couple books that just have firsthand accounts. and those are the best places to start because you really get a sense of how people move in the world 
by reading like a diary. Um, there were some nurses. You know, a lot of those were collected in Brian's book. It's um, just like, I can have it right here. It's, it's enormous. Um, Whoa. <laughs> yeah. Wow. So a lot okay. of the people I talked to, and then the books that I read are also reflected in his narrative. And But I do think the firsthand accounts were incredibly helpful. And then I also, in New York, um, there's a mass observation, which is more in the UK, but still it was firsthand accounts. And just hearing people's, I mean, you were asking earlier kind of about the layers of the violence and a lot of it came from those accounts, but I couldn't use everything. Like you can't use every detail and it's having to pick and choose the best way to tell the story. Yeah, I think you did a really wonderful job. Um, I have, oh, Maris, are you coming back to? I am. Shoehorn us out. <laughs> um, but, but not to rush you, but uh, oh. to say thank you both so much. And if there's a final question or thought you want to leave us with Kirk, that, that would be amazing too. Um, and if not, just thank you. This has been really fascinating. Yeah, I guess Kirk, I do you have something to say? Um, well, I just want to thank everyone for coming. You know, the pandemic has certainly been, as Diane's book came out in August of last year, so she's had this experience too. And I just appreciate the support and of my publisher, of my friends, of my family. And I look forward to coming to New York when the paperback comes out. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And we can see each other in person. But I also, yes, for people who haven't read it, this is Diane's oh. novel, The New <laughs> Wilderness. <laughs> and as I said, I did cry when I read it. Um, and it also Yay. has extraordinary descriptions of landscape and nature and a very memorable mother daughter relationship. So. Like yours. Yeah. Um, Thank you. That's nice of you. And if you haven't read uh, The Elephant of Belfast, I highly recommend it. I was completely sucked in and I have two little kids in, in the pandemic and that's hard to do. Um, and I, I read it and read it and read it kind of in as many, as few sittings as possible. So thank you very much. And thanks for asking me to do this. And thanks Maris and McNally Jackson. What a joy. Thanks, everyone. Thanks. Good night. <laughs>